we uh, have a formidable, formidable test today to summarize our experience with this epidemic in 40, 45 minutes. I think I'll be up to the task. Uh, <laughs> we will see. So uh, thanks uh, especially to Dr. Salvador Guloneto, my ex-students back in Brazil for a long time ago, actually. But it's uh, very nice to have him uh, today uh, and um, having this invitation to be with you and all the people at home. So let's uh, try to share my screen here. Let's see what comes. This would be my first slide, as you can see, is a mapa mundi. And this is a bear, a California bear, maybe. So we, this guy just slept for six months straight. He woke up and he was lucky, but uh, it's strange times, as I said, and uh, we don't know what's ahead of us, but maybe he's not so lucky because he's now going to be with us. So let's see what lies ahead. Uh, I have no association in any way to, to products, merchandise shown in this presentation, or even to pharmaceutical or biotech companies. These are my disclosures the usual way. So semiotics is the medical theory of science and symptoms, and it's called semiology also. But uh, nowadays it's also used for signs, significations, language, and as you can see here, very clear cut signaling. <laughs> and this happens all the time in California mountains, I guess. So I'm going to try to start with some uh, words and from the words catch the significance, the semiotics, what is behind these words related to this epidemic. Freshly out of the internet, some uh, latest numbers. And here we have, I call your attention to one million deaths. And also in the States, 205,000, this brings us to 637 deaths per 1 million. Not far from what Brazil is seeing, 673 deaths per 1 million. And we have already more than 145,000 people deceased. So big numbers here. And for sure, we are two countries that are on the top of this list right now. So let's start with some curves. Curves uh, are ubiquitous nowadays. Uh, you saw this many times for sure. This is the time course you have here, a snake, a black snake uh, signaling that we have severity of illness. We have the viral response phase, this would be stage one, giving a place to a stage two and a stage three where you can see hyperinflammation, the cytokine storm, macrophage activation you know, people are still uh, talking about that and of course this is useful because you can have clinical symptoms clinical signs and potential therapies for each one of these phases this is all being uh, debated and we are not going to enter in this kind of uh, discussion today we don't have time for that but uh, probably we'll have uh, shortly a stage four what i'm calling stage four and this would be a post-COVID syndrome or long COVID, as people are talking. And we don't understand exactly the physiopathology behind all these symptoms. But a huge legion of patients are reaching this stage four. And they have clinical complaints. And we still don't know how to deal with this population. Also in kids, we may have here some patients that either passed by all these stages or didn't have any symptoms at all, that they have the, this Kawasaki-like syndrome. And this is also a multi-system syndrome and uh, dealing with, uh, with some autoimmunity features. This other curve is uh, from the beginning of the epidemic. This is from February until March, three weeks here, one week, two weeks, three weeks. And you can see that we could learn uh, since the early days in Italy, and this is north, northern Italy, you see here Bergamo in pink, and you see Lodi, uh, another town near Bergamo. And if you remember correctly, Bergamo hit many, many cases, and uh, to the point that they had to select patients in the intensive care unit. Uh, over 70, 80, they were not chosen over the ones that were younger. And this is a huge uh, bioethics di dilemma for this, those physicians there. 
But we could learn that with uh, some measures, simple measures for the population, that you can have less cases, like in the case of logging, if you really adhere to this, uh, to this message and the population understands this. So we are going to come back to this situation later on. This is in Portuguese, so you can <laughs> learn some Portuguese here. But uh, I didn't translate because you know this, uh, this curve, this is the one for, uh, used for flattening the curve. And flattening the curve would mean that we would have the same amount of cases, COVID-19 cases, over time, and not uh, going over the capacity of the system like in Bergamo. So this is uh, something that happened, uh, um, and uh, at, at least people tried to do it. There were always some people still today that still say that it's just like a cold or a small flu, and other people there are really uh, taking some precautions and trying to help the healthcare system. So we don't have it full. Uh, today in the Wall Street Journal, I saw this, why hospitals in America can't handle COVID surges. They are flying blind. Or, or, this is to say that even with all the measures we had here, and they were not uh, homogeneous as one knows, uh, we still have uh, really big problems in the system. And I'm not going into this because this is not my area of expertise. I'd like to come back to this graph because in Brazil, I think this is different. We don't have this capacity uh, here on top, on this line. Our capacity is here from the beginning. So even flattening the curve for Brazil, this wouldn't be bring uh, the, uh, the results we intended from the beginning of the pandemics. We had time to prepare, of course, and uh, the politicians did a lot, but not enough. Uh, otherwise, we would not be in this position of having almost 150,000 people dead. Right? Uh, of course, in places like Sao Paulo, the lockdowns worked, at least for a while, and um, the best uh, hospital structures are in Sao Paulo or in Sao Paulo State, um, in Latin America, in South America at least, together with Santiago de Chile. They, have, uh, they also have very nice hospitals. And uh, in Rio, the, uh, the situation is quite the opposite, I would say. You can see here some favelas, some slums, and um, instead of the, the sugar loaf taking tourists, it's taking uh, bullets, right? So the gangs are there. And also you can imagine that in each one of these small houses, you leave 12, 15 people in one room. So how can you isolate them? How can you trace contacts here? How can you test people here? So Rio is really a different reality. And from the beginning, I was uh, reassuring myself that this would be a big um, um, population health experiment in public health. And uh, this is exactly what is happening right now. We are learning uh, from uh, this natural selection that is happening in many places in Brazil. Another curve that you may see is the, the curve for testing. And uh, you learn that the PCR uh, or the antigen rapid kit tests are used in the very beginning in the viral phase. And afterwards, you can test for IgM, IgG, and uh, many patients do not have this kind of humoral response. They do not build IgM, they do not build IgG or IgA. Um, and even uh, this way, they, uh, they still achieve some immunity especially with uh, cellular immunity. But this is another story for another life in another place, in another time. Uh, other curves you can see here, at least in San Diego every day. I, I received this uh, paper here. Uh, and um, we have here like um, daily positivity rate, of tests, how many tests were positive, and also total death for San Diego so far and also the 14-day average of positive tests. So you see lots of curves and the, the uh, average population is learning a lot of epidemiology, uh, myself too. My wife is a clinical epidemiologist and my statistician, so when I face some uh, major hurdles here, I ask her and most of the time I can understand. 
So the curves are very important to also to let us know about excess death. And we learned that excess death are the most important thing right now, because if you see the average death is for Western Europe, Latin America, States, Russia, and South Africa, you see in the, like light pink or orange here, but you see the uh, red lines, these are the excess rates due to the COVID epidemic. And this is really huge for Russia, for example, for South Africa, and for, uh, I, I'm sure here there is uh, Brazil and Peru, um, and Mexico also, Mexico is in third or fourth place uh, regarding lethality. So uh, it's, it's huge, it's huge. In Brazil, just for you to have an impression, this is the excess death rates. And here you have from January, until August, because September is still here. This is uh, not correct. Of course, the data is not here yet, but you can see the huge difference that we can see in excess death corresponding to the epidemic. So talking about death, let's talk about casualties. Uh, we thought at the beginning this was a, a respiratory disease, right? The upper airways and the inferior airways. Uh, actually, there is some uh, findings in the alveoli and the bronchi, and of course there is like a, a pneumonia line. But also we found this in the computer tomographs. It's a glass, glass ground appearance, and this is measured nowadays in percentage of the total volume of the lungs. And uh, I'm sure that even the lay people nowadays know how this uh, kind of uh, finding in the X-ray and the computer tomogram means. So we um, could then uh, really go by the symptoms. So patients that are asymptomatic but spreading the disease, mild to moderate symptoms, going to the hospital and then to the intensive care unit and depending on also not only the symptoms but also on uh, common tests performed by the clinical pathology lab. We also learned that this is not only a respiratory disease, it involves the endothelium and it involves uh, like uh, in an endothelitis-like uh, fashion. So there is information of the cells lining the vessels here. Uh, this is uh, alve an alveolar and uh, uh, you can see this all over the body actually, even in major vessels. And you can see here a thrombus and this is a coagulopathy. And many mechanisms are involved, especially the immune competent cells. Actually, why this is a, a widespread disease in the body? Because we can find this ACE2 receptor in many organs. You can find in the lung, of course, you can find in intestines, heart, eye, liver, even the placenta, the brain, pancreas, kidney, bladder. So uh, uh, it's kind of ubiquitous and uh, so that's why you find so many symptoms and, and people are complaining for uh, very different things uh, along the course of the disease. And as I mentioned, the immunology is there, uh, including autoimmunity. There are many responses that we are just now understanding. This is one, for example, just came out that there is a strong, potent uh, interferon antagonism um, that is caused by this virus, direct in interference by the virus, and this interference is of course our natural way of fighting virus, the, the, the belonging to the innate immunity. But there are other curves, <laughs> like this one. We have other curves and casualties. This is the economy. I don't have to go into this. This is India records 23.9% shrinking of the economy. I think the states is 9% um, so far. Brazil in the last, in the second quarter of the year was almost 10%. So the world is in the deepest lump since the Great Depression and we have 400 million jobs lost worldwide, 13 million in the US and 8 million in Brazil. These are official numbers. In Brazil probably is double. Is more like 16 or 15 because uh, there are lots of informal jobs that are not counted in these official statistics. People here also are dying. 
um, from COVID-19 and they don't have life insurance here. This is a big problem. In Brazil, at least, we have the SUS, the SUS system, the overall coverage of the population. People complain, but at least by law, everybody has uh, a right for this uh, condition, for this uh, health insurance. Um, uh, warrant, the warranty is by the state. And also in this paper by the economists from last September 26, the pandemic is plunging millions back into extreme poverty. So we are coming, uh, going from poverty to extreme poverty. And this is uh, a phenomenon that's uh, happening the world over. Um, other casualties are in the domain of the psychiatry psychologists. This is very important. We uh, there is this opinion from the Wall Street Journal, now September 17th. Uh, we are condemning millions of Americans to financial instability, depression, and even domestic violence. Uh, this erodes age old social costumes like visible smiles and human touch, which are critical to social cohesion and personal well being. So, this is uh, two phrases that are very important, I think. I'm a clinician, so I lay lots of value in this uh, relationship, physician-patient, and we are seeing, even over the internet, uh, many patients tired of being at home with insomnia, boredom, uh, isolation, loneliness, uh, stress, of course, and so that, uh, just in this um, statistics here from Time magazine, you can see, for example, for depression, mild, moderate, moderate, severe, and severe. You go from before the pandemic in the orange year to the red after the pandemic, and you see the numbers are really staggering. And so these are keeping uh, the psychiatrists and psychologists, even over the internet, very, very busy, I'm sure. They, they in their turn, are having their stress and, and depression because of all that. And I heard this, hearing is the new hug. Uh, but of course, there are new ways of doing it, like in this picture. I think this is very touching. And um, it's a way of uh, really uh, showing the affection between families. It's uh, very sad. This is in Spanish, of course. Uh, I'll translate for you. This, it says here, physicians in the pandemic. This guy here in the intensive care unit says, it's a lot of days I don't miss my doctor. And the other guy here says, I am your doctor. So this, are, this is other face of the casualties where you see every day in the social media, uh, people honoring their physicians like this guy here that passed away September 23rd. And then you see each one of these entries here is one physician belonging to Unimed. And Dr. Salvador Gulunet, who works with Unimed in Brazil, so he knows very well what I'm talking about. We are losing lots of colleagues, and not only colleagues, we are losing healthcare workers. So that in America, until June 2020, we lost almost 600 healthcare workers from COVID-19. This is from WebMD. Of course, uh, some Brazilians like to do some magic. And I found this uh, yesterday in Belo Horizonte. This is, must be something from the TV, a TV show, now in the social media. They are playing resurrections. As you can see here, we have a negative death rate in 24 hours for this city of Belo Horizonte. So uh, something uh, very rare and peculiar is uh, happening there. Gadgets and the new normal. This is important because it touches also health and the healthcare system. I'm using this one. This is a COVID-19 from the Massachusetts General, and I report almost every day, even if I'm well. It reminds me, it comes to the screen, then I touch this and that. If I went out of my home, uh, if the place was crowded, if I used masks, what type of mask, if I did some testing, so everything is in there and they are doing some research. I didn't have time yet to see what they are doing exactly with the data, but I, I'm sure I'm helping there. So I invite you to join. And of course I have the Alexa application at home. My kids uh, had me to buy, I should have it. 
and I learned that Alexa uh, can be told to get the latest COVID-19 news. Um, I can tell you that I didn't have time to do it because I have so many sources for this that I don't know if this is good or bad. Um, I received this uh, last week, this here. It's a sanitizer alarm clock with Bluetooth speaker, and it uses ultraviolet C. Uh, I don't know exactly why I would use this. It's an alarm clock, as I can see, and it disinfects, sanitizes my smartphone. So maybe there is there's a public. Uh, out there to buy this kind of stuff. Maybe this is most useful. So um, I don't know exactly how um, correct is the reading here, but as you can see, it reads my blood oxygen level. And this could be important if you have symptoms, of course, and if it's lowering, you must talk to your physician, go to the hospital and the rest, you know. So this is what will be uh, happening soon here. I know there are some cities already testing this. Uh, this is in China, but you can see the conditions. Uh, lots of these wires here on top of the streets. We don't, almost don't see here in San Diego. Um, but in Brazil, this is overall. Uh, and uh, so it's very important that they are showing the, this drone can deliver goods, can deliver whatever you need, food, from the supermarket, and it avoids all the wiring. Uh, so it's a nice development for sure. Of course, we are doing all virtual meetings. And this is something that I didn't expect to see. Manhattan offices are nearly empty. And you can see a picture here from this, uh, from the Wall Street Journal. So um, kind of sad, uh, a big city, New York, the umbilicus of the world or something like that. And of course, of course people working from home, but um, many people also in furlough or lost their job. And of course, there are uh, substitutes that you can uh, use. For example, this virtual reality headset. And you can have a meeting using your head, special headset for that. So in the future, we are going to have a meeting, this meeting, uh, with a headset, special one. When the CEO is in the office, uh, so it changed now. The CEOs are going to the office to take care of the enterprise and everyone else is at home. So if you see this in your golf course, these are retired people for sure. These are not the CEOs, they are working now. <laughs> it changed a lot. This virus, virus uh, really has some qualities and capacities. So telemedicine. Telemedicine is also something that we adapt very quickly. In Brazil, there is new laws, at least during the epidemics, these guys are going to use it. So. I guess uh, we are doing well with that. I also entered in this and I, I already had my telemedicine place in the internet, it's just for Brazil. It works fine and um, uh, the experience is really nice. If you guys have any question afterwards, I'm glad to, to, to ask. Uh, this is school. The schools uh, changed a lot. This is in South Korea. This is majoring from the high school. I guess it was here in San Diego. At least it was here in America. It changed a lot, as you can see. No hugs. And this is a training, a karate training. You can see it, masks all over. And I, I called these guys uh, and they said, yeah, yeah, no, we are using during the training. <laughs> OK, it could be difficult, but this is the new reality. New reality for architecture. The buildings are going to change. For example, windows are going to open now. And you know these aquariums that we are using, this uh, glassy ceilings and, and windows uh, all over the new buildings. We are going to have balconies again, open air, fresh air, big lobbies. So everything will change in this regard. Um, people are getting saturated of, of staying home. And so they are flying to nowhere. This is a kind of an awkward experience. but the flights are full, you know. The, this here, for example, they are taking planes to nowhere from uh, South Korea, from Australia, and they are paying big bucks. The plane leaves one city, stays three, four hours flying around, and then comes back. <laughs> Same place. And people are happy. <laughs> okay, and uh, the, uh, back at the airport, if you are in Finland, you are going to see dogs sniffing you. 
they are not sniffing you all around, they must sniff your strata or on the axillary region. So these are dogs that are really trained and they can with pinpoint accuracy detect if you have COVID, even if you are asymptomatic. We know how dogs detect it by smell, but we have no clue what they detect yet. If we find this out, we can train thousands of dogs across the world. This is from the University of Helsinki. Uh, I know other, other places that they are training dogs and I have statistics for that, that in France, for example. And the problem is that the, the dogs get uh, tired, of course. Uh, you have to keep changing the dogs. And so I don't know if there's some practical way of doing this, at least not for many others. Uh, meanwhile, I'm walking my dogs. I don't, I'm not training them for the smell. Uh, I'm here in Encinitas, North Calgary, San Diego, walking my dogs every day, twice a day with my wife. And um, we see that uh, there is almost no people. We keep physical distancing. So normally we don't wear masks. I see 50% of people wearing masks all over. And of course, if we go to crowded places like supermarkets, uh, Costco, or any other place, we wear our masks. Talking about masks, you can always be very sure that you are not going to get COVID and you can use this one, not so practical. Maybe this one from the 17th century, this was the Rome plague. You, it's complete, you see, it's tight. It gets the beak with some herbs inside and then you have a lens to protect your eyes and you even have a stick to palpate the patient from afar from a social distance. So we learn from these guys for sure. We, you can also go with uh, some uh, mold trends like these politicians here, or you could use these very useful ones for the hearing uh, impaired, uh, for lip reading. And you can see this is a plastic piece here and you can buy over the internet. I found this very useful and I guess many people should use this. Uh, I wouldn't use this. And nowadays, many, many people are talking about this, uh, how to spread by coughs and sneezes, uh, all the secretions, all the aerosols. And this is from 2014. There are more graphics ones. This is from 2016. And now we learn that the aerosol can go up to eight meters. So we are learning a lot from this. And the transmission studies using masks from one side, the healthy person or the carrier, and when both use masks, from 70% to 1.5% transmission probability. Uh, and this is interesting. If you go to the supermarket, you can spot people and know the personality types, like this one that believes in science, this one denies science, this doesn't understand science, and this one believes in magic, if you go with that. Now, let's do something more serious. Uh, well, I have two experiments to show you in closed environments, closed, uh, closed experiments. One is in this Diamond Princess cruise. This has uh, involved 3,700 passengers and crew. So 136 passengers got infected, passengers and crew. And you can read all the details in the internet. The important thing is there was no mask use in this Diamond Princess and 40% of, of the positive patients for COVID-19 were not patients at all, they were asymptomatic. Now comes the second vessel, and the second vessel is an Argentinian one. They started in Ushuaia at the tip of South America, they went to Antarctica, and they were supposed to go to South Georgia and Falkland Islands and back to Ushuaia. But in the middle of the course, the ship changed its course because they discovered COVID-19 patients inside the vessel. So they went to the Falklands, they went to Buenos Aires, no way to dock there. Uruguay accepted them, 20 kilometers from Port of Montevideo in the Rio de la Plata. So they stopped there, everybody disembarked and they test everyone. Of course, we can compare these patients because they are normally the same median age, you know, tourist vessels. So in Argentina, these Argentinian vets, they were all using surgical IN95 masks because they, when they started from Ushuaia, it was March, and they knew already about the infections and the epidemic. 
So 81% now are asymptomatic and we may attribute this to the use of surgical masks. So masks work. Now we can see masks not used or kind of a mask in this meat processing plant. And you know the epidemics, uh, the epidemic was running wild in these factors. Many of them uh, had to close. And they are, there are many, of course, uh, all over the uh, America. So mild to moderate symptoms will happen in only 5% of food processing plants employees when wearing masks. This was after wearing masks. And they test every single one, and 95% of them were uh, have asymptomatic infections. Um, and even if you believe, still believe the CDC, then Dr. Robert Redfield said these face masks are the most important, powerful public health tool we have. I might even go so far as to say that this face mask is more guaranteed to protect me against COVID than when I take a COVID vaccine. Are harsh words, but uh, not everybody believes in masks, as you can see here. So masks reduce COVID-19 severity, fatality rate, and protect you and others. This is what the data, the majority of the data is telling us. We, uh, I think, fail to protect the elders in nursing homes. The USA population in nursing homes is 0.6%. 40% of the death happened in nursing homes. As you can see here at this Massachusetts Veterans Home, those with virus symptoms were in quarantine, 76 died. This happened in Europe, this happened in Sweden. In Sweden, they treated with morphine uh, to sedate the patients that were uh, with dyspnea, having dyspnea. They didn't use oxygen and no physician was uh, able to uh, examine personally these institutionalized patients. So a very sad story, but this is another um, uh, live, another talk. Politics, I'm not going to enter into this. I'm just mentioning that the White House pressured the CDC to downplay the risk of sending children back to school. This was from the New York Times a couple of days ago. And in Brazil, we had this. Uh, or famous cartoon where after one day after the president said that uh, the 5,000, 10,000 deaths that had occurred, uh, the, 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 the reporter asked, uh, now, now, Mr. President, what are you going to do? I said, so what? So what? Uh, so many people died. Um, what do you want me to do? Something like that. So another sad story, right? And of course, the corruption that uh, happens in this kind of situation. In Brazil, it's uh, all, still all over. Um, the police, the federal police is uh, very active in the latest day because of that. And this comes uh, from the politicians, maybe. Unhappy, unfortunately. So, and we have this uh, oppositions here from the left, fear, Denial from the right. Mask use here, no mask here. Lockdown, open the economy. Close schools, open schools, no chloroquine, chloroquine. Uh, this is really is confounding the people, the layperson, and uh, it's the opposite. We would like to see a common message based in science. Retractions, talking about science, a few high profile retractions of COVID papers have left the public unsure as to what to believe reducing their confidence in the medical profession. Very profound. And you saw the Lancet, the New England Journal papers retracted on hydroxychloroquine, and this is uh, from other countries too, retracted papers. And so here are the reasons, concerns, issues, errors in results or conclusions going all the way to dishonest presentation. So you figure out what's happening. About therapy, just uh, some brief words. This is the intensive care unit uh, to remind me to tell you that we learn how to respirate with the mechanical ventilating patients in the prone position. This uh, really helped a lot even before the ventilation. And uh, many proposed drug treatments, uh, very difficult to conduct randomized controlled trials in this situation. And uh, Many people that recovered are now super donors. They are super heroes now because they are donor of convalescent plasma. I know that in Brazil, 
many hospitals already have this in stock that they can use. And you can see here the survival rate uh, really uh, is better now. From uh, March, you have like 66% survival rate, you have now 85% more or less. The vaccine, we have only three in phase three, none approved so far. This is our greatest hope. Uh, we have problems with the Russian vaccine and the China vaccine, at least one each, where they are shortcutting the phase three trial and we don't know what's going to happen. It's another experiment. And we have challenges for the vaccines because you know that probably we'll, we'll need two doses of vaccines. And uh, remember, if you, you can imagine the paperwork necessary for that, the adhesion that people will not come back for the second shot. And you cannot interchange. You must make the second shot the same brand as the first one. Then you have the anti vaccines Then you have the price. And then you have the problem of distribution, the logistics. Uh, remember, for example, the vaccine, the messenger RNA vaccine, the new technology, this must be stored at minus 94 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so it's very special freezer. And the uh, physician's office don't have that. In the third world, maybe some places, but not overall. So let's finish with some damage control. My 10 steps to control the COVID-19 epidemic. There are others, of course, but I think these are the major ones, the most important. So we first must learn from the past. Not everybody has learned from the past, unfortunately, and this is something that we have to regret. I already mentioned you this. These are a group of physicians in the medieval ages, but we can still learn from a lot of this, even the costume. Uh, here's the second wave and third wave for the Spanish flu in 1918-19. So there are second and third waves. And um, this is Philadelphia and this is St. Louis. So um, cities that closed, uh, made the lockdown from the beginning, uh, had more uh, bigger death rate than um, cities that uh, uh, really um, didn't do the, 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 the lockdown, sorry. So Philadelphia had a big, big spike here. They didn't pay attention to the lockdown. In some ways, St. Louis did. So this is something that is being studied. This is MIT News. And the data is picked, they say. Stronger pandemic response yields better economic recovery. And this is a lesson from the 1918 flu pandemic. Wise lockdowns and reopening are in the order of the day. And this is something that I wanted to see because it explained very well social distancing. Yeah, so let's keep our cities <laughs> on top of everything else. Um, third, support the economy. 61% of restaurants closed temporarily because of COVID-19 that have transitioned to permanent closures in America. And here in San Diego, local businesses wonder if they can outlast COVID, especially restaurants and bars. Uh, it's tough for the economy. Support elders, underserved, minorities, low-income people. You know, for example, that um, black people are 7% of the population, if I'm not wrong, and they uh, were involved in uh, 30 to 40% of all the cases of COVID-19 cases for many reasons. I don't have time to uh, go into this, but this is very important that we pay attention. Hygiene, masks, and distancing, of course. Support healthcare workers and hospitals the best way possible. We had huge problems here in America at the beginning. Test with purpose. I think we should test symptomatic and asymptomatic, but we must have a system of contact tracing and do the test with some purpose in mind. What are we going to do with this positive test? And we also can test the sewage system to know if any part of town is still involved or in college, for example, this is being used here. Contact tracing, as I mentioned, you can go via an app. 
like they used in South Korea, extensively, or you can do by uh, call centers and everything else. This is very poorly done here in America, and I think not at all in Brazil. And then you isolate. You isolate COVID-19 positive patients and contacts. A self-isolated home or the, um, the city should have a hotel there just for that or public building, you name it. And last, not least, a clear message to the public. Be the first with the message, be concise, be direct to the point, uh, don't lie to the public, don't confound people with uh, half facts or uh, half truths. Uh, it, this is what happens, uh, and we are seeing this all the time. We are the experts here, and uh, we don't have the weight of our, a guy on YouTube. <laughs> This is uh, really sad. And this is the reality we're facing right now. And um, as physicians, as clinicians, I think we'll pay this price also because it will be tougher and tougher to convince our patients to have a nice uh, physician-client relationship, physician-patient uh, relationship based in um, earnest uh, truth and uh, the reality of what is uh, behind every diagnosis and the therapeutics involved. So this is the last cartoon that I have, and unfortunately, this is wrong. This is the, uh, should be not a physician. This should be the health care worker, right? And uh, the COVID is not uh, alive by itself. It's dead outside uh, a human living body. So um, it, it's not correct. And also, we don't have the swords here. <laughs> This is a superhero and uh, still the physicians are lagging behind. We are lagging behind. If you find someone that behaves like this guy here, you'll be suspect because we still don't know. We're still learning. We must be humble. We are, we are humbled by this virus for sure, but we'll conquer. We'll, <laughs> we'll especially with a, a good vaccine, vaccine and a good uh, logistics for distributing this vaccine, we'll get there. So thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take some questions.